Hello everyone, welcome back to Just My Stupid Opinion for the first episode of the new year 2019. So first things first, I would like to say hello to all my new subscribers because uh, over the last few days, I've had growth that I haven't seen since uh, probably about this time last year. Um, I My one video with a shady history of the Trudeau Foundation just seemed to take off over the last week because um, for a long time, I was sitting at uh, 10K on that video and then just over Christmas time, just a little bit after, suddenly I started checking, when I would check my YouTube uh, channel, I suddenly had 20 new subscribers, then 30 new subscribers. Now I've, over the last few days, I grew over 100. So I want to welcome you all there and thank you all for subscribing. Thank you for watching. But now my video, this video is sitting at, it, this says here it's 18K, but on the actual video itself, it's, a, it's saying I'm sitting at just over 19. So welcome everyone and I hope you enjoy my content. So I hope everybody had a good new year. Uh, mine wasn't too bad. I spent a lot of time with my family and uh, then spent the new year with some friends. Just had some people over to my place. It was a good time. But unfortunately, it seems like 2019 isn't getting off to a much better start than 2018 did. I'm not really going to be discussing a number of issues on this. This might be shorter than my previous episodes because there's one topic in particular that I want to discuss today. And for those who don't already know, although it's making the rounds on social media, so I'm sure a lot of people are well aware of this right now, there is a new party here in Ontario, and it is a big threat to Canadian way of life. And that party is the Islamic Party of Ontario. We finally reached the point where we have an Islamic party here in Canada. So we're joining countries such as Sweden and um, Belgium, I think. I think those are two countries that have... Uh, that have Islamic parties, although I think those are federal. This one is just a provincial one. But uh, what really sort of tipped me off to this was Tarek Fattah's, um He ended up coming out with a article on that called Coming Soon, Believe It or Not, Islamic Party of Ontario. And he, t he t talks about some disturbing stuff that ends up taking place in, uh, that he's already had with the creator of the Islamic Party. But first things first, it's already been determined that Election Ontario has granted the Islamic Party of Ontario the first steps towards registration. So as it says here, the Islamic Party of Ontario has officially reserved its name with Election Canada as of October 2018. So this is something that actually kind of went unreported and not many people, I don't think I heard anybody talking about this until just the last couple days, right until about December 30th, right up into this new year. But this is going to be a significant threat to Canadian way of life, Ontario way of life, really, because that's who it's going to be affecting. So I don't know how many of my new subscribers live in Ontario, but I'm in the nation's capital of Ottawa. So I'm very concerned about the direction that this is going to, especially because when I heard about this, I took the time to look through the platform that has already been released by the Islamic Party of Ontario. And it is for every sense of the word, trying to implement Sharia law here in Canada. I remember a while ago, I was having a conversation with my mother about uh, about Islam and that, and I remember she looked me dead in the eye and said, Sharia law will never come to Canada, unknowing to her, apparently, that Sharia law is already acceptable in the civil court system for things such as divorce, but now they're trying to take it to, an, uh, they're trying to, take it to a provincial level. And if we're reaching this point where Ontario one of our most populated provinces in Canada has an Islamic party, you can guarantee that that is coming to other provinces. My guess is Quebec is going to be next. The west of Canada is probably going to be the least affected by it for a while. But we're going to take a quick look through some of the things that they have inside of their, inside of their platform. Because like I, said, I stated, it's very concerning. And even what Derek Fattah put out uh, concerning the... Uh, the creator of it, the founder of the Islamic Party of Canada, is itself concerning. Because uh, this ended up only coming out yesterday, January 1st, but uh, as he sort of just uh, opens up talking about the Islamic Party of Canada, 
he talks about how in beginning of 2018, you received death threats and things like that, and how 2019 for him wasn't much different. He says, yet towards end of 2018, a much more subtler th uh, death threat was addressed to me, this time by the head of Canada's newest aspiring political party, the Islamic Party of Ontario. So this is coming from the head of the party, and he's already getting a form of death threat. He says, in a column posted at the end of October targeting American activist Laura Loomer, Anwar described me as, quote, Islamophobe T uh, Tariq Fatah in Toronto Sun. Tariq uh, is an open enemy of Islam and a hate purveyor, end quote. And what he's making reference to, uh, okay, I did switch the screen so you all can see. What he's making reference to is this, an article that was put up by Azsarah.com. Now, they're making, it was written a little while ago, and it was making reference to how uh, Faith Goldie and Laura Loomer ended up, uh, when they were in Toronto, were were protesting an Islamic group, uh, protesting against ICNA, Canadian Muslim Convention in Mississauga. So that was uh, in Thanksgiving. So I remember that. In fact, I've never liked Laura Loomer. I always thought she was full of crap, and I don't trust her any farther than I could throw her. But he is very true. He wasn't lying. Tarek Fatah was not lying when he said this because we can see here. He said, did she succeed? Again, talking about that protest. The answer is no. However, she did at least one good job providing a topic badly needed in a written, uh, write a column to another Islamophobe, Tariq Fatah in Toronto Sun. And that's where he goes on to say, Tariq is an open enemy of Islam and a hate purveyor. He loves and waits for these topics. So... What is most important about when he says that an enemy of Islam and a hate purveyor is because what it talks about inside of the Islamic doctrine when it comes to the enemies of Islam, it talks about how you treat your enemies and like being labeled quote unquote an apostate inside of Islam is a very dangerous thing to have done to you. That is literally going to lead to you being, that could very easily lead to you being um, hunted down by by islamic extremists and there's a lot more islamic extremists than any anybody likes to admit in here in our our country as well as around the world this whole idea of political correctness is is trying to downplay it but we know that the number of terrorist attacks that take place most of them come from people who are muslim we also know that when it comes to gangs that are uh, around in our society many of them are muslim in fact one thing right now that's become a big thing is that Islam is recruiting straight out of prisons. They got, like a lot of people, like especially in Europe right now, but I also think in North America, that when it comes to people who go into prisons, the prison system, they end up converting to Islam more than any other religion. So that's pretty damn concerning. And I think the big difference when you t uh, compare this to some things uh, when it comes to Christianity is that people, uh, these criminals, end up getting recruited to Islam and then they become a a foot guard of Islamic gangs. It's not quite the same when in Christ, uh, in, when the priests and stuff go into the prison system. They end up trying to turn people's life around, get them an education or something like that. So I think this is the main difference between the two. And uh, Tariq Fatah ended up putting out stuff on Twitter about this, about how he... He feels like he's been labeled an apostate. Actually, he shouldn't say he even feels like he's been labeled an apostate. He has been labeled an apostate by them. And that can carry a death sentence with many of these extremists. So we have a new threat here in Ontario that has to be fought back against. Now, let's take a look through about some of the things that they talk about inside of the, the platform. Because that's going to be very important to what they want to implement and very eye-opening to those who don't already know and haven't checked it out already. So, here it is right here, which you can find it on islamicontario.ca. If anybody's interested and wants to go look for it yourself. So, I highlighted the most important parts of, the, of everything that's in here. So the first things first is we have here where it says the word Islam means surrender and peace. That means Islam requires surrender to God to attain peace. Islamic party is synonymous of the peace party. <laughs> this is just going back to the idea of the, uh, of the religion of peace, which we all know could not be farther from the truth. But they're trying to do the same thing in here. And they're trying to act, they'll see it too, that they try and act as if they are they are going to uphold the Canadian charters and your freedoms and your rights when they're not going to do anything of the sort. In fact, they make reference in here to smaller government and less control. But then if you look at what they want to limit you to, what they want you to control, 
then they are nothing of the sort. They are actually a big government, and despite the fact they say we are neither capitalist nor communist, you can definitely tell that they are socialist government because they take more shots at capitalism, and they also take more, uh, uh, they make, by the things they want to implement, is much more social benefits. So we're going to see this as we get into it a little bit more. Uh, we're going to skip the second part because it's, all it really goes on to is talk about how the oldest dean of God and how that uh, plays into pretty much it's more about their beliefs than it is about what they're going to implement. But they say here, Quran is the latest and final edition of divine books that provide gui a complete guidance to all mankind in all walks of life that include politics and governance under the belief of supremacy of God. So right there, what they end up saying, that is without saying the words, they are saying, we're going to implement Sharia law. Because they say, it is the guidance to all mankind, all walks of life, including politics and governance. That's exactly what Sharia law is. It will control you based on your political, social, um, uh, based on their political and social beliefs. So we already know the dangers that come with that. I mean, on Twitter, I put out, I said... You know, if you try and make my wife wear a burqa or a hijab, there's going to be a revolution because there's no way I'm going to let some fucky party such as this dictate how my wife chooses to dress. And the thing is, too, is the way that they're describing it, it's very clear that they're trying to make a Muslim supremacy party here. It's not going to be... It's not going to be equitable to Christians. It's not going to be equitable to atheists. It's not going to be equitable to Hindus or any other groups out there in religions. In fact, if this is also what's kind of funny is like in the past is a lot of these feminist groups and also the LGBT community have stood with Islam in the past and talk about how all these poor, uh, poor Muslims and how they're so oppressed and everything. Well, now they're going to create a party which is actually going to suppress the rights of both women and the LGBT community. So, good going, guys. You really did this to yourself. This is the point we're at because of groups such as these. And uh, the reason I put this in red is because they kind of go together. It says, Quran and Sunnah are two uh, sources of guidance given by God, the creator of human beings and the whole universe, to shape our private and public life. Sharia, once again. The Islamic Party of Ontario sets its policies of governance, economy, social justice, human dignity, healthcare, family life, environment, and justice, etc., according to the Quran and the Sunnah. So they've told you exactly there the thing that how they're going to implement themselves. They can't come out and actually say that they are. Uh, that they're going to implement Sharia law because in the West, Sharia law does not have a good connotation because people know about certain things such as how a woman has to have something like it's... I think it kind of varies from country to country, but it usually needs at least a minimum of two witnesses if they've been uh, sexually assaulted all the way up to four and uh, in order to prove themselves because a woman's testimony is worth, is worth at least half of that of a man's. So... <sighs> So this is exactly what they're just saying in this. They go on to explain that this is exactly what they're trying to do. The relationship established under a marriage contract is sacred union between a man and a woman. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So right there, for anybody that's gay or in the LGBTQ community, uh, this also goes on to include, uh, what do they call us, um, polygamous. Right there, they're showing how they're going to control who you can marry, and it has to be, you have to be married to someone of the opposite sex. And if they use the worst joke ever, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, in order to dictate this, in order to, to tell you how you do this. But uh, this is exactly what they're saying by this, that people in those communities are going, not, are going to be unable to marry a man, uh, and they can't marry, marry another man, or they can't marry another woman. Uh, already polygamy in Canada, is, if I'm remembering correctly, is still considered illegal as long as you're getting married. Although the funny thing is, this doesn't seem to affect those who are in the Muslim faith. Because because uh, there's so many groups, of, uh, so many Muslim people who come over with their wives and then they end up importing their second, third, and fourth wife. In fact, just at the grocery store a couple months ago, I was, bu I was buying groceries with my wife and we had no doubt that we, wa we saw a Muslim man that had three wives with him because he, he was him and three women. These women could not have been his daughters. He wasn't that old, and these women were, weren't, were like, really young. 
they was one who looked about to be about his age and the other two were a little, looked a little bit younger than him but you could just tell by watching this you're like this dude it has three wives with him there but th that's always but that doesn't seem to be disallowed when it comes to canadian law they tend to get that pass over there but yes we're such an islamic phobic society we let them circumvent the laws and we go on here, it says, the right uh, of all to have food, clothing, and shelter with dignity to all. The right to own these things. Now, that right there is a socialist point of view. Now, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm a little to consider myself to be a compassionate guy. I don't want people to go hungry. I don't want people to go cold, especially in the country we live in. It's uh, like, it's just an awful way to live. But that doesn't mean that people have a right that they can just come in and demand food and clothing and shelter from other people. But this is exactly what they're trying to implement here in Canada, in, uh, in Ontario, sorry. They're trying to implement this, which may, to me sounds a, very, a lot more similar to someone like the New Democratic Party that we have right now under the leadership of Andrea Horwath than it does an Islamic party. Because this is what I noticed. Despite the fact many people in Islam are they're con ultra conservative in their social views, they're actually very socialist in their political and economic views. So they're very traditionalist. They want a man and a woman, and the way that they br they bring their their children up and the way that other people have to live their lives but then they want all these free handouts all the free money in fact in germany because of the welfare system and the amount of muslims that came over and were abusing the welfare system they're saying that germans native germans are going to have to work a lot longer in their lives to, in order to reach retirement just because of the social debt and the fact that they're predicting that as time goes on i think it was i think it was by the year 2030 they're predicting that the that the social benefit, like social welfare system that so many of these Muslims are taking is actually going to be something like 3% of Germany's economy. That's ridiculous. That's going to put them in astronomical amount of debt. The thing is, too, is many of these people who come over are unskilled. So they're not going to go out and get a job. They're trying to take advantage of the welfare state that's in Germany. And someone like Angela Merkel is allowing them to do it like the globalist that she is. We move on. Interest-free capital and work partnership economy. Neither capitalism nor communism. Well, this is what I was making reference to. They say neither capitalism nor communism. Well, they definitely have a socialist way of thinking. And despite the fact they try and play it down the middle, oh, we're neither capitalist nor communist, you're going to see that throughout this, they make con uh, constant accusations against capitalism himself. Capitalism, which is the system, uh, the economic system that has actually made the West a a rich place to live in with a high standard of living that gives people a lot of choices in whatever they uh, they want to do who who they buy their insurance from where they buy their groceries things such as this despite this they're going to take count countless shots against it now this one I nearly laughed when I came across it freedom of the individual including freedom of speech religious practices worship and assembly. Uh, you cannot have freedom of speech while you have people that are advocating for things such as Islamophobia. And this is exactly where people like Omar Algebra and um, um, Ikri Khalid, how they've come together and shown the problems that, uh, that, that what they've been pushing for has led to this moment right here. I mean, uh, let's also look back is what they what did they say about um, Tariq Fatah? He is an Islamophobe and an enemy of Islam and a hate purveyor because he's critical to Islam itself. So do you believe that this party comes in, they're going to believe in freedom of speech? They're using the exact same way groups like the Liberal Party does and the NDP. And my perfect example right now is the Ontario NDP because they never speak about freedom of speech. The only time they ever try and bring this up is is when it comes to trying to defend themselves. A good example is that leading up to the election in uh, June of this past year in Ontario, there was one of the NDP MPs that was dug up back in 2013. She retweeted a quote that was by Hitler with a picture of Hitler. And the quote was, and I might be paraphrasing a little bit, where it says, uh, if you want to change the rules, 
reach the top of the current system and then change them from the top. And it had a picture of Hitler on there. And then they're trying to downplay this by, oh, it's freedom of speech, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. But then at the same time, they go out of their way to call everyone else racist, sexist, Islamophobic, transphobic, and try and implement laws that would prevent you from speaking about these topics. So this is exactly what they're trying to do. You're talking about religious practices. This is a Muslim supremacy group. And we've seen how all across the Middle Eastern world, how they forced out all the other religions. The Bible is banned in 50 countries around the world. Where are those countries where the Bible is banned? All of them are in the Middle East under Islamic fucking uh, Islamic governments in Muslim dominated areas. So do you believe that they're going to give you the right to religious practice them the same right that they're going to give to the rest of Islam? What about those who don't believe? What if you're agnostic or an atheist? Do you believe you're going to have the right to go out and criticize this Islam the way you could before? Although, as I've stated before, because uh, those who are new to this uh, this podcast, I've mentioned many times in my in my, on this that I'm an atheist, but I have big problems with the atheistic community because it's been overrun with political correctness and then many of them will have no problem shit talking christianity but oh dare oh don't you dare touch the the poor downtrodden muslims and their religion how dare you say that, be critical of them so many of them are like that especially if they happen to be white atheists i've seen so many um ex-muslims who have no problem criticizing islam even though they're atheists but that's one of my beefs and I have with that community. But do you believe they're going to give you the freedom of religious practice and worship and assembly? No, 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 no. They're going to use their, their power once they're inside a government to suppress your religion or your religious views or lack of religious views in order to, uh, to make Islam the dominant uh, to make Islam the dominant religion here in Ontario, and then from there, they can spread to the rest of Canada. That's exactly what they're trying to do here. They're trying to make inroads here. So let's look a little more into their policies. Social. Family system has been has to be restored to protect the generation of, susta of sustained human beings on Earth until natu uh, its natural ends. Marriage is a sacred union between a man and a woman. Well, there you go, LGBTQ community. That's just saying that you don't get the right to marry who you want. But this goes even farther than that. This is, I believe, that the way that the wording is they're going about it is they're going to try and put an end to divorces in general, or for the most part, put an end to divorces in general. Go back to the old system where a woman couldn't leave her husband regardless of how abusive he is. This is, uh, this is what I believe, and it goes more into what they talk about over the next couple paragraphs. The Canadian uh, family system and marriage institutions must be restored for the survival of the coming generations. Uh, they should be given privilege and affordable housing for healthy living and nourishment. So this last part right here about the given privilege and affordable housing for healthy living and nourishment. What I think about when I read that, what I thought about, I should say, when I read that was I was thinking about the child benefit plan that was introduced because, well, and affordable housing as well. But the main thing that came to my mind is the child benefit plan, because when they introduced the changes made to the child benefit plan, people like Trudeau came out and say, oh, you know, we're giving more money to every families around the world, but uh, around Canada, sorry. But what this ended up doing was it was clearly giving more money to new, uh, new Canadians and new immigrants that came to this country because they, um, these are the people who are coming in with the most children. Most Canadian families, native-born Canadians, they're not having that many kids. Two, maybe three at most. Like, three kids these days is kind of perceived as a large family. So, when you have all these groups of people that come into your country and end up, um, that come into your country and end up, that end up having four, five, six, seven ki diff uh, kids in total, they're going to benefit the most from that. And this is exactly what I think they're about doing, but on an Ontario scale, which is going to benefit one group while taking away from the rest of the people who pay their tax money into it. And then it comes to affordable housing and things like that. They're going to, they're going to force the people, especially when we're talking about contractors and people who work in this industry, in order to make, create affordable housing, which means they're going to lose money on it. Things such as this. 
And then here in much more, this is just go actually, sorry, I realized we kind of touched on this earlier, but they said relationships established under marriage contracts as a sacred union between a man and a woman. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. We already touched on that. Okay. Obscenity, vulgarity, nudity, and perversion must be checked. Well, I would say, asides for nudity, this is a very broad spectrum that they're talking about. What is considered obscenity? What is considered vulgarity? What is considered perversion? Because this could be a wide range of shit. I mean, for them, and this even goes on to what it says right below that, where it says liquor, drugs, adultery, gambling, etc. should be banned in society. So, I'm drinking a beer right now. That should not be allowed. Drugs should not be allowed. Adultery, so they're going, they're going to have, like, what, people monitoring you, make sure you don't do this sort of thing? Like, something like that is between a married couple. It is not the place of the government to come into your marriage and dictate the way you go about it. Uh, should be banned from society. Gambling as well. So, a lot of the vices that we already enjoy are going to be banned according to this Islamic party of Ontario. This is revolting, if you ask me. And this is exactly what I'm talking about, is they're going to make reference down here about how they're talking about they're about a small government, just really small government. That's what uh, government should be for. But then they're going to check about what you can do, what you can consume. They're go they want to go back to... Um, Prohibition. Well, we already know that from Prohibition, it didn't fucking work. When they talk about banning drugs from society, they want to reopen the war on drugs, which was atrocious. Uh, it didn't work. And then one of the problems with the war on drugs is because you take down a big drug dealer and suddenly it creates a power vacuum for other people to get into. So the war on drugs was not successful and it caused more damage than good. Uh, ironically enough, there's also an Islamic drug pipeline in Canada where a number of the, it's just that, it's that a number of these drugs come from Islamic countries. They are sold on our streets by Muslims, but then this Islamic, uh, the Islamic party is going to say, oh no, we can't have any of that. Well, many of these people are probably exactly why, uh, exactly why we're in the situation that we're in today anyway. So... Uh, this is just, it's very vague, and I don't like the direction that they're going into. In fact, they even make reference later on here about smoking should be banned as well. So you can't, you can't have a cigarette, you probably can't have this. Do you see how the, beginning to see how this is a threat to, to your way of life, a threat to your freedoms? Society is always better when you give the people the freedom to make choices, the freedom to do what they want, as long as it's within the constraints of the law. But this is not what's going to end up happening. Like, when you want to ban something, it's not going to stop people from doing it. If you ban liquor, if you ban drugs, people are still going to do it. They're just going to do it on the black market. So you're just creating more black market, which means there's going to be more gangs out there that are fighting for control of that, such as alcohol. But let's move on. Education. The purpose of education should be uh, no more. Uh, ed the purpose of education should no more be just a professional material gain. It should also be a moral and spiritual upliftment. So they're going to teach Islam in school. Let me ask you something. How many great accomplishments does the Muslim world have when it comes to the world of, say, mathematics? Now, you can't sit there and say they have none, because I'm pretty sure they have at least a few. But all in all, it was Western education and Western philosophy, Western mathematics, that really created the world the way it is, to, to, to create our understanding of the world for the way that it is. But now they want to implement their own it doctrine into this. That's just going to be absolute failure. And we already see how, when it comes to school... The Muslims are already trying to push for benefits that are not uh, given to them already. So one example, excuse me, one example of this has to do with, I think it was back in uh, 2013, I think around that time of year, that the Toronto District School Board was noticing that 
that Islamic students were leaving on, I want to say it was Fridays, but they would leave school because they would go to the mosque and pray at lunchtime or something like that, and then they would be on for hours or they wouldn't come back at all. So in their public schools, they said, oh, you know what? We're going to turn, say, the cafeteria into the uh, into an area where the Muslim students can pray. So they were showing one of the big no-nos when it comes to public school is showing preferential treatment for one religion over the other. And the other thing that was really bad about it was that that led to segregation because then you were having uh, the women, the little girls who were on their periods, couldn't pray and were forced to sit off to the side because they were considered unpure. They were considered dirty because of it. So all they're trying to do is make more inroads here, and this time they're going to try and put the Islamic doctrine into our schools. But this, uh, considering, I think I actually said it back at the beginning, where they pretty much said they consider Islam to be the rightful religion of the Western world. Something along those lines about, but anyway, let's take a quick look up here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we can find it. Uh, uh, I know, I know it said something about this, I, cause I couldn't believe it. I actually think, uh. Okay, here we go. So they're talking about Dean, uh, and uh, just they say the Dean is system of life that they're talking about. And right down here, they say, we understand and believe that Islam is the native Dean of Ontario and Canada. Not the fact that it was a real, uh, that it was a country that was founded by the Christian world, and we could have the discussion about whether the West is as free as it has been because of uh, of uh, Judeo Christian values, or whether that happens to be because those values are put in through the Enlightenment period. We can have that discussion later. But the point is, Islam is not the dean when it comes to Ontario or Canada. So. Let's look at what else they say. The experience and, uh, and surveys show that boy-only and girl-only schools produce much better results. We will support the gradual transition from co-education to gender-specific schools. Segregation. They are trying to bring the third world to, can uh, to Ontario specifically right now. We'll get in. It definitely will spread to the rest of Canada if we allow it to happen. But this is exactly what they're doing. They want segregation amongst the, amongst the genders. Now... Don't get me wrong, when it comes to something like school right now, it is more uh, it is more created the way that we learn right now that is beneficial to girls over boys because uh, boys tend to learn more with hands-on, doing things, working with their hands than they do in sitting in a classroom and getting lectured at by a teacher. So women do benefit in that way, but you're going to go to the extent of banning uh, uh, sorry, you're going to go to the extent of segregating them and create only boys and only girls school? Well, we know when that happens, things such as uh, usually people to become much more promiscuous because we can see how the things, and when you try and segregate the genders and you try and teach them to be very proper, that's not what ends up happening. We all know the stories about uh, Catholic schoolgirls. Moving on. Government funding to all faith-based schools with the freedom of conscience and religion guaranteed by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms must be granted. They don't get this now. I mean, I'm pretty sure when they say that and they talk about faith-based schools, I don't believe they get that the Catholic School Board gets funding from the government. Now, if, if I'm wrong on that, someone correct me in the comments section, but I'm pretty sure that they don't get that. It's the public schools that get public funds. Anyway... I'm not going to sit too long on that because uh, because I'm pretty sure uh, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but I might not be. Economy, a just economic system, neither capitalism nor communism. What is a just economic system? An economic system is supposed to be for the betterment of a, of a society of the country. It has nothing to do with what is just or what is fair, because life ain't fair. In a just society, it's not possible that one section of society is super rich and the other section of society is super poor. We believe in the Quranic principles of spending, uh, sadka, charity, and the interest-free economy. These are the God-given principles. We strongly believe that if Canada chooses this economic system, the economy of our nation will flourish and we will never get depression and face an economic 
and it cuts off there. <laughs> it literally goes, we'll never get depression or face an economic... I guess they were going... I think they were going to go with economic crash or economic downturn because of that. But that right there, what they're talking about, is incredibly socialist. They're talking about the redistribution of wealth, which... <laughs> I don't think we need the Islamic Party for that. We already have Justin Trudeau wanting to do his universal basic income right now. So we really don't need him for that. But are you fucking retarded? You do it that way and we will never get a depression or face an economic crash? Have you seen a socialist country? They all live uh, live terribly. They, they're... Their dollar drops. Even their natural resources are no longer valuable. I mean, look at look at Venezuela. It's one of the most oil-rich countries, and their oil doesn't bring them any profit anymore. This is what you're going to face. And if you want to address things such as economic crash and depressions, how about you address the fiat currency? Addressing the fiat currency and trying to get people back on the gold standard would be a much more stable way to run your economy than an economics, uh, than a interest-free charity principle, if that's what you want to do, which also involves the, which also involves uh, wealth redistribution. And besides, if this is really the Quranic principles and the Muslim way, then explain to me the House of Saud. Explain to me Saudi Arabia, which have the royalty have are so freaking rich. Yet there's still all these poor people living in your country. Don't get me wrong. Saudi Arabia is like a richer country. I'm not trying to say like that the royals live in extreme affluence and then everyone else in the country is living in extreme poverty. But the point is, is there still have a lot of poverty inside of Saudi Arabia, a lot of poor people. Why hasn't that system rose, uh, risen those people up? Because you're full of shit. That's why. Just like the socialists out there. Recession and slowing in the economy will only be avoided by interest-free economy and capital worker partnership finances, where circulation of money will never be stopped. We already covered this. Ontario is the second largest province in, uh, in area in Canada, and Canada is the second largest country in the uh, area in the world. It has vast unused land. Despite this fact, the majority of people don't have their own homes. Laws should be ma made to break the chain of control that maximizes the price of the home. You do realize that a vast amount of that unused land are frozen tundras, right? Where it's too freaking cold in order to live. And even if we did to start, we started building on that area you have all sorts of problems such as power lines not getting out there nor water being able to get out, to get out there in fact when it comes to the indigenous um, water problem some of the problem not for everyone but some of the problem is is the fact that they they live really far north and there's no water mains that go to them that is one of the problems Sure, we have a lot of unused land but then they also talk about how they're environmentalists so they want to they want to build on this land to create housings for everyone, but then at the same time, they want to preserve the environment. This, this doesn't make sense to me. They're literally tripping over themselves here. And here we go. It's right under that. It says, believe in less tax, small, but efficient government. The same small and efficient government that's going to outlaw adultery, that's going to outlaw what they consider to be pervertedness and obscenity, nudity, liquor drugs cigarettes like you can't do this and have this much social control over your population and have a small but efficient government that is literally what a big government does and you certainly cannot have a small government if you're going to engage in wealth redistribution so it's just ridiculous to me and just a quick little uh joke that I heard from a stand-up comedian, but he talked about uh, this one stand-up comedian, Sean Mayo. He ended up talking about how there, could you imagine that if your marriage certificate was run, like your driver's license, so just your one time you're having, um, you're having sex with a woman and then suddenly the police break in, it's like, excuse me there, is that your wife? No. Oh, you're joyriding. Well, do you, are you at least wearing a condom? No, I'm not. No insurance just this is pretty much it was a joke but this is literally what they want to do when they're trying to implement something like outlawing ad outlawing adultery anyway and then 
something we already touched on, food, clothing, shelter, and dignity for all. We already touched on the problems with that. Uh, we go down to health now. The super profiteers medicine manufacturing companies are making sure that they would produce medicine to manage the disease and not for the cure of the disease. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, you don't get me wrong. Big Pharma does try and create uh, create the, not the solution, not the cure, but they do just try and create the medicine, which makes them all the money. A patient has to use the medicine throughout his or her life and increase the dosage over the period to help the, the capitalists and capitalism going on again about how they claim to be neither capitalist nor communism, yet like to take plenty of shots at capitalism. There is no cure of any disease in the so-called modern era. The situation must be changed. Well, I believe it might be take, making a comeback, but polio for a long while was completely eradicated. Um, but they, they're not wrong when they say this, but if, this is, if they're going to implement this, why the hell hasn't been, this been done in the Islamic world? Where have they been coming with their great breakthrough when it comes to medicine and cure research? They haven't, so don't expect anything different. We support investment in research and development for alternative medicines that may be more effective and less expensive. Example, naturopathy, herbal, homeopathy, and others. Give at least same chance to other ways of treatment to prove beneficial. Great, they're going all new age on us. I'm not opposed to when they say alternative medicines for small things you want to get you want to try a tea for your cold or something like that go for it if you want to try some more natural remedies for something basic go for it but don't try and peddle this shit when it comes to big time disease that can actually kill people justice and rights goal a crime free and peaceful ontario well, apparently they haven't paid any attention around the world recently because then they would know that it's the Muslim people that are involved in a lot of the crime sprees that are out there. Look at the UK where they have Muslim rape gangs walking around. The same this goes for countless countries. This is in the UK. This is in Sweden. This is in, um, uh, this is in France. This is in Germany and plenty of other European countries ever since they allowed a lot of immigrants to come into their country. But then they're going to turn around and try and act as if this they're going to change the way that things work and make a crime-free and peaceful Ontario? I mean, fuck. Look at the shootings that are going on in Toronto right now, which is where our provincial, uh, provincial parliament sits. We've had a record number of shootings in 2018 and... A record number of homicides in 2018. Guess how many of those were involved with Muslim groups and Muslim people? And look at the, t the amount of terrorist attacks that go on all around the world right now. Most of them come from Muslims. So you're going to sit there and try and preach to me about a crime-free and peaceful Ontario? Go fuck yourself. Democratic and human rights of a person in his individual life will always be protected unless it transgresses the rights of life, property, and dignity of others. Well, I earlier on, we saw how they were actually going to circumvent democratic and human rights already, so we don't need to touch on this. Should be a strict law to ban blasphemy of all religions, all symbols, and uh, strict should be a strict law to ban blasphemy of all religious symbols and personalities. So, there you go. Freedom of speech, and yet you're going to ban all blasphemy to religious symbols and personalities? <sighs> I'm getting a headache just, just thinking about it. But it's not really going to end up happening. Because, again, we see how a number of Islamic people all over the in all over Canada, America, mostly Europe as my examples right now, how they have vandalized churches and stuff like this. And you believe want me to believe the Islamic party is going to stop the Muslims from vandalizing a church, let's say, or prosecute somebody, a Muslim man who vandalizes a church? I don't believe it for a second. Now, this is where it goes a little weird. Not weird, a little crazy. Don't waste, don't pollute the environment. 
Wasting a few drops of water, even if you are sitting at the brink, uh, brink of a river or plucking a small leaf from a tree without reason is not allowed in the, in the Islamic way of life. So they're going to charge you for wasting water or plucking a small leaf from a tree without reason? Are you kidding me? And besides, the biggest mistake that they're making is they're acting as if they're they're freaking acting as if uh, this is a Muslim dominated society. It's not. Most of these people are not Islamic, but in their point of view, that's the way the world should be run. And now this one nearly killed me. The rights of animals are to be maintained. Now they make reference here to um, what do you call it? Uh, well, uh, what, what where does it say? Mass slaughtering ha houses. So, yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not a big fan of those either. But they're saying, oh, they're saying, oh, you know what? We're not going to allow this. They have the right to be slaughtered in the halal fashion. Because it causes less trauma to an animal than the massive horror of cruel mass slaughtering houses. Welcome to the halal fashion. That's a river of blood in Bangladesh capital after Eid Mubarak. Welcome to the halal method. Here is like a stadium or a mall or something where the blood is just splattered across the ground in the middle of public view. Welcome to to the halal way of life. And the thing is, too, is in the past, and the problem with halal is it's actually going on in France right now, is the fact that halal, uh, the halal industry has become dominant in their country. So for somebody that, say, wants to go get themselves some chicken, like a, Fr uh, a French uh, native, they've got to go mostly to a Muslim, uh, a Muslim butcher shop where they deal with halal foods, and they give their money there. This is also where the Muslims buy because it's halal. Now, the problem with that is, is that Muslims have a tendency to put the money back into their own community. So they'll end up, so they'll give their money to the butcher, who then in turn will use that money to benefit the Muslim community, but it doesn't go out to the rest of the population. So the money stays in the Muslim community, and those, those natives have to come in and put the money into the Muslim community. Do you see the problem here? They get all the money and give nothing back to the society that they came into. So this is the, uh, this is the halal way. This is the Muslim way. And then finally... Choose a path to achieve 100% renewable energy in Ontario. I don't think these people have... I don't think they're really aware of how unprofitable the renewable energy industry is right now because most of the time when we're talking about that, you have nuclear energy, that's fine, but most people don't like nuclear energy. I shouldn't say most. A lot of people don't like nuclear energy because nuclear energy is... Um, nuclear energy is people see th hear things like Chernobyl and then they get really nervous about having a nuclear reactor in their city. So not a, a lot of people like that. But whenever I hear renewable energy, I always think of wind farms and solar panels. Now, that's fine if you want to have your own wind uh, your own wind turbines on your property or have your own solar panels. Um, in fact, I'm actually someday, I'm probably going to invest in solar panels for myself, for my own house. But you can't do this on a huge scale like you can't do this all throughout all of Ontario because it's not profitable it takes something like 10 years in order to pay off a, a to pay off a solar panel or something like that now you really don't make them a lot of money so if you're just going to put all your time and effort into achieving 100% renewable energy most of that through solar panels or wind farms you're going to go into a huge debt because of it so this isn't going to work and at the same time, where do you think so much of the Canadian uh, economy comes from? It comes from the Alberta oil sands. And that also goes on, and that if it, there's so much about the environment, uh, and that's the Islamic way, why the hell do so many Islamic countries profit off oil, like Saudi Arabia being one? That's where they make all their money on, but that doesn't seem to matter to them. They are a social, they're double whammy. They're a socialist party and an Islamic party. That could not be more dangerous. 
It'll damage your economy. It will damage our rights and freedoms and our way of life. And this is just the next step because there was a, for those who may know, the Quiggin Report. Tom Quiggin, I like him. I think he's very well spoken. I think he's got some good research and some good, uh, and I think he's got some good um, points of view. But anyway, he put out one of his episodes that he put out, which is, was put out just a few months ago, maybe back in about October. It was the Quicken Report number 29, Political Entryism and the Standard of Evidence. And in this, he was talking about how Islamists were uh, were entering, were circumventing, I shouldn't say circumventing, were silently entering the Conservative Party. He already makes reference to how this already happened with the Liberal Party and the NDP Party, but now they're making inroads on the Conservative Party. So let's take a quick look at that. Uh, listen to that because I think that would be uh, I think that would be what he says is very important let's move on from that to the other main subject we'd like to discuss today and that is the infiltration of the Conservative Party of Canada convention this year by Islamists and as I noted above this is a process known as Political entryism. What is political entryism? This can be defined as the policy or practice of members of a particular political group joining an existing political party with the intention of changing its principles and policies. They do this instead of forming a new party. This is not new. This has happened to the Labour Party in the United Kingdom and it has happened to a variety of other political parties around the world. And it should be noted it is not just the Conservative Party here in Canada that has this problem. The first public article that talked about political entryism in Canada concerning the Islamists was written in April 2014 by a gentleman by the name of Tahir Gora from Mississauga. This article suggested that the Muslim Brotherhood and jamaat e islami would attempt to run multiple candidates in the 2015 federal election using the Liberal Party of Canada as its political entry point. The question must arise as to whether any candidates in the 2015 election represent extremist views brought into Canada by the Muslim Brotherhood, its proxies, or its front groups. With some 700 dues-paying Muslim Brotherhood members in Canada, this question is increasingly relevant. According to this 2014 article by Tahir Gora, quote, the Islamic Society of North America, the Islamic Circle of North America, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and others are full of members linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, jamaat is islami and they subscribe to their ideology. This article also states that the author had a long conversation with a staunch member of Jamati Islami. He reports the conversation in the following manner, quote, We want Muslim representation in our parliament so our members can watch our interests in the government, unquote. By Muslims, of course, he meant Jamati Islami and Muslim Brotherhood followers. One would have to say that the outcome of the 2015 federal election suggests that they enjoyed a certain degree of success in this process. What comes to mind here, of course, is Omar al-Gabra, Ikra Khalid, and others of that nature. As noted, it's not just the Liberal Party, it's the Conservative Party and the NDP as well. In April of 2018, we had a special edition of the Quiggan Report called Enemy on the Ballot. In this report, we examined the attempt at the provincial level of Kadir Shah to win the nomination for the Conservatives in the riding of Mississauga Centre. Now, this was an interesting little situation because his campaign manager was a fellow by the name of Ahmed Atia. He was an interesting choice for campaign manager because his father is Dr. El Tantani Atia, his sister is Sarah Atia, and his brother-in-law is Khalid El Kazaz. Dr. Atia, by the way, is the executive director of the Majid Toronto, otherwise known as the Dundas Street Mosque. This mosque has had a lot of problems concerning its preachings about the killing of apostates, the killing of Jews, etc., etc. This mosque also self-identifies as being part of the Muslim Association of Canada, and Dr. Atia made his views clear with respect to the mosque when he told the press, here we follow the teachings of the Muslim Brotherhood. Dr. So that's just a snippet of what uh, Tom Quiggan was talking about. But you can see the problems already. They've already made inroads when it comes to... Um, they already made inroads when it came to the Liberal Party, already the NDP. Now they're trying to make inroads on the Conservative Party. And when it comes to the... When it comes to Ontario, we're seeing this a little bit right now. Because the 
the Islamic Party of Ontario has been doing some work with the current re uh, regime, the current administration, the Doug Ford government, when it comes to um, sexual education and the idea of gender in in uh, our schools and things like that. So we can already see how they're making inroads right now into our governments. And like he said, many of them are not so much that they represent the Muslim the Muslim people, but they represent Muslim extremists like the Muslim Brotherhood. So this is the danger that we're seeing. But now they've started up their own party. And that party is going to run in the next election in Ontario. They've got four years to build themselves up. Well, more like three and a half now. But you can see where the danger comes from. And this is why this is the new enemy facing the people of Ontario and the people of Canada. Because you can guarantee that this is going to come back to bite the whole country in the ass. And it's funny because I it's when this past election was coming in and it was looking like it was going to be neck and neck between the, the Conservative Party and the NDP. I said to, I, my wife and I were at least talking about the possibility that if the NDP won with what they want to do, such as make Ontario a sanctuary province, we were talking about the possibility of actually moving out of province. I was looking more toward the West, like not even Quebec, but I was like, I don't know, like Manita, Saskatchewan, Alberta, these would be more along what I would be interested in than anything else. This, if the Islamic Party of Ontario won, this would be something I definitely would be looking to get out of Ontario for. There is one silver lining in this, though, that we can look at. A lot of times, the parties such as um, the NDP and the Liberals have relied strongly on the minority vote, including the Muslim vote. This looks like that might split them from this. So I think when it comes down to next election period in Ontario that the NDP are going to lose votes because there's going to be people who get siphoned off towards the Islamic Party. I don't believe the Islamic Party would win the next election, but the danger is not so much what's coming up in the next election, but the next few elections. The danger is coming up because if they're managed to build themselves up, there might be a day where the Ontario government is made up of the Islamic Party of Ontario, and that's a scary thought in my opinion. So I actually ended up going for almost the full amount I try for new subscribers. I try and do an hour of uh, whenever I do episodes of the podcast. So I actually end up going almost the full time on this. And if anybody stuck around till the end, I really appreciate it, as always. And leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. And I'll be back soon with another episode. Uh, so thank you all. I'm Adrian Lloyd. Welcome, uh, welcome to 2019. And this is just my stupid opinion.